Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here this evening. And before I uh, turn to Mayor, I'd just like to say thank you um, to Shandy and Sheldon and Hedda Rudolph and to all the people who got the program going and have kept it going, because I can say it's wonderful to step into a program at this stage when it's up and running and it's got respect and it's got students and it's doing wonderful things and it's, it's, uh, there are certainly uh, new directions, new ideas um, you know, that I'd like to introduce, but it's there already. And so thanks to every one of you for making it such a great program already and such a great base for all kinds of new things. Um, so this evening we're here really to talk about um, writing and translation and what lies between. And the first thing I thought we would do, Mayor, is to um, put our cards on the table as writers and translators. So uh, I've tried to count this, and I'll probably get the total wrong, but it's got to be something close to 20 books. Eight, um, eight works uh, for children, three works of nonfiction, uh, six novels, a family memoir that's almost unclassifiable. It adds up to somewhere around 20. Uh, and one translation, right? Yes. So I'm sort of the opposite. I have now two novels, and I actually forgot to count my own translations, but I, I suppose it's 12 or 15 or something like that. So I think maybe that can be our point of departure, talking about um, writing and translating and where we each are on that continuum. Well, uh, do, do you want me to translate more? Uh, I don't <laughs> Well, I think you should even things up a little bit. I don't know if I can, well, but at least you can. I, t I translated one, one, um, one book, which is a, not a children's book, but a juvenile book that was written in the United States in um, 1927 by a Bengali writer, an Indian writer from Calcutta, who lived in the United States. It's a book about a homing pigeon uh, which I reread when I wrote uh, A Pigeon and the Boy in its first translation to Hebrew. And uh, I found out it's a great translation, but unreadable for, for modern day Israeli kids. It's funny, you know, in, uh, we have, I think, Tom Sawyer was translated four times to Hebrew, but wasn't written again in English, you know? It's it's because it's it's because uh, <coughs> our <coughs> the Hebrew language is changing so rapidly that uh, that a new generation finds it very hard to. I mean, it's easier for the for a modern day kid in Israel to read a, a biblical chapter. It's easier than to read the old translation to Hebrew of of Huckleberry Finn, for example. Um, so I translated this book. It, it was uh, harder than I expected and yeah. more enjoyable than I expected. I, I liked it, but I put uh, a lot of effort in it and I decided never to do it again. Mm. <laughs> Could you please repeat that? It's kind of music to my ears. Um, yes, everybody, the act of translation really, really is difficult. And I should know because I've translated two of your books. And, the second um, one is quite easy. You, oh, quite easy, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> it was easier, I'll grant you that, Look, but it's I never think, easy. I think I have right. my, uh, uh, is Emilia Yulazari here? Yes. This, this lady translates my second novel, Isau, to Bulgarian. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think translating from, from Hebrew to Bulgarian is even more difficult Why? than what you do. <laughs> Well, not if you're a native uh, speaker uh, of Bulgarian. Well, first she knows that my, my father-in-law will be able to go over the translation. <laughs> and he's, he can be a, a, a severe person. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and also because, you know, for us it was quite, uh, it, it was very nice when you finished your translation. We could sit together for two, three days go over the text, we could exchange ideas in places you thought uh, one direction and I thought the other direction, because English is the only other language I, I can read. Uh, all the other languages, I have to trust my, my, my translators well, fully. I have to admit there have been days where I wished I translated into Swahili. Yeah. <laughs> um, not necessarily because of you, but um, yes, because when you translate into a language that you're a writer knows, or thinks he or she knows, or 
knows somewhat, then um, you run into problems because they always have comments. And some of the comments are very helpful and some of them are very unhelpful. Um, but um, I know that basically I've always enjoyed it. And what I loved about working together with you, uh, especially on Pigeon and a Boy, because that was a more complex book, we didn't know each other as writer and translator at that time. I think we trusted each other even more by the second book. But we worked really very closely. I don't think I've ever worked as closely with any writer as I have with you on, on Pigeon and a Boy. And m what I loved about the experience was that um, we, we talked, I suppose, at a level of writer and writer in many senses. Mm -hmm. So um, what was great, and this is a really important thing, a really important aspect, is that Mayer would go over everything very scrupulously. And as you can hear, his English is fine. His English is more than fine, I can guarantee you. He understands the nuances of English very well. But like, even when you write me an email, you make lots of mistakes, which is fine. Um, you know, nobody's asking for anything more than that. And because Mayer knows such, uh, uh, understands uh, so well the English language, our dialogue was on a very high level. So he would ask me, about a certain sentence and, and say, well, why not this instead of that? Uh, you know, he would choose a particular word. And what was great about this dialogue between us was that sometimes I would, I would listen to his choice and I would say, you know what? I like that. I like that better than what I chose. I, didn't, I wasn't worried about embarrassing myself in front of Mayer. I did that a few times, I suppose, but once or twice I remember. Um, but that wasn't my fear. I, I was in it to make the best translation I could, and if I had the help of the author, then that's fantastic. But there were other times when I would say, no, 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 that won't work because, and Mayer would say something like this, um, I'm happy to hear the explanation because I want to learn, but I trust you. And if you say no, then I'm going with whatever you have decided. And that is such a key element between a writer and a translator. It can't work if the writer is second guessing the work of the translator all the way along. So you know, thank I, you. I, I, I have a children's book translated to Japanese. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it, it's, uh, it's called my, uh, Abba Osebu Shot. My father always embarrasses me. It was trans translated to Japanese, and Japanese are orderly, polite people. They sent me the, the text to go over. <laughs> uh, and I decided to, to go in their direction. And I put a, I put a big, thick, red line under one of, under one of the, the lines, and I said, I don't like this one. <laughs> you have... You have to redo this. Uh, this I think it's not rhyming properly. You have and no idea what chaos you course. caused in on yeah. a, an entire floor chaos? of a Japanese I publishing think it, house. I think it costed lives of people. You know? <laughs> it's a, the author is not, is not satisfied. The one thing I do with every translator, even the ones I, I cannot understand, um, is asking them finally to read me a page or two aloud in their language, which I may not understand, because I want to listen if there is a, a music to the story. This is very important for me because I come from, I, I write my books uh, with, with, a, with a, a, I would say, a, a primitive passion to tell a story. I don't want to educate my, my readers or to bring peace to the world or, or to improve. To, to make you better people, uh, I, I, want, I want to tell a story. And, and uh, a story, even if it's written in, in high Hebrew, and sometimes I'm blamed for that, uh, I think should have the music of an oral story. Um, and, and this is something I want to hear. And, and even if I don't understand the text, I can, I can feel if it will break the teeth of the reader or not. I remember you did that with me. There were certain cases in which I would translate a sentence and I would end it with an adjective and then another adjective, following exactly your pattern. Whatever you had first, I put first, and whatever you had second, I put second. And when you read the sentence, either you did it yourself or you asked me to read it aloud, and you said, no, switch the adjectives. And it was solely a choice based on the music of the sentence. Mm -hmm. And of course, the writer in me liked that, and you only had to do that two or three times. So. Uh, once I realized that you, that was your yeah. interest, then I would look for those, um, you know, kind of patterns uh, and, as well. And maybe there is also something special about the Hebrew language, 
which is used to be translated to many other languages from, from the Bible, of course. And when, you read, when I read the Bible from time to time, when I need to read it in English, I find out that, that the, the, the English Bible is so larger than the Hebrew Bible, not only because of the vowels, and the longer words, but also the, the Hebrew language is so much more so much more compact by nature. And I think we were talking about it that the, our phrase "Al Yitalel Choger Kim Fateach" in Hebrew, which is four words, is translated in almost any any English translation of the Bible to sixteen or eighteen words. He who takes off his, he who wears his armor before going to battle should not boast as the one who takes it off. Al yitalel choger kim fateh. Kula al yitalel choger kim fateh. And look what they have to do in, in the English language. Uh, and, and there is something in, in the Hebrew which is very minimal, very, very, especially in the Bible. The story is minimal, the, the metaphors are minimal, the, 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 the style, and, and, and this is something that, it's not my style, but still it is something that is in the nature of the language. Well, uh, you have a kind of special place of honor in the people that I've translated. I, um, I could actually refer to the people I translate by percentage numbers. I know for each of my writers how many more words there are percentage-wise going from Hebrew to English. And you and one other writer are the only two that hit 50% consecutively, uh, uh, consistently. Which means that I know that if I receive a Meir Shalev text that is 80,000 words long, that in English it's going to come out to 120,000 words. And I also know that that because Mayor Shalev is one of the most careful writers there is, so nothing is going to be dropped when we move from uh, Hebrew to English. Although I did tell a story once, and I told it in your presence, so mm -hmm. I, can, I can do this again. Uh, I made a big confession to Mayor once, very publicly. Um, when we were working on Pigeon and a Boy, there was a very complex scene um, uh, in which the issue at hand had to do with nikud in the Hebrew language. And of course, that's a concept that doesn't really come across in English at all. And uh, it, was, it was a business about whether the word should be pronounced, uh, the coup should be pronounced shovach or shovech. And uh, it's a discussion that takes place in, uh, in the text. And, I, and it also required me to translate um, some alterman. Mm -hmm. which I spent days trying to find a translation of, found a book at the Hebrew University, had someone bring it to me, and it, the one stanza that was missing from the translation was the one I actually needed. <laughs> so I wound up having to do this thing on my own. Anyway, um, we were, I worked really, really hard on this. And uh, when, it, when we sat together, Mayor said to me, well, you know, you've done a really good job, but maybe, maybe this doesn't need to be here. Now, all that work, and um, frankly, we translators work by the word. <laughs> We're paid by the word. So I'm seeing all that time and all that money, all those, you know, 27 shekels <laughs> flying out the window. <laughs> and um, and uh, so we decided to appeal to a higher authority, the agent. <laughs> and she said, it's a book of 400 pages. Just drop that page and a half. <laughs> now, what happened after that? I honestly and truly do not know because when the galleys came back from the publishers and I was going through them, that scene was there. And first I thought I'd accidentally sent them the wrong set of my uh, editing, which, which would mean that these people had wasted weeks of work because of a, a mistake of mine. Then I discovered it was the right version, but it was still there. And to this day, I do not know whether it was an ego, money, time thing on my part, and I left it in brutally, um, a, you know, in a two-to-one vote um, and, that I lost, or whether I genuinely and innocently forgot and, and left it in. So um, that it's, was... It's a, okay. Either way, I, I, it's... Um, <laughs> it must have been okay because yeah. I was just worried that there was going to be a re review that said, great book, but that scene would show back, and then, yeah, and then the my cover would scene. be blown. Yeah. Um, you know, with 20 books, I mean, that's, that's just an incredible number to me. And there's a writer who once said that writers, what we do is we keep writing the same book again and again and again. Can you make a comment on that as a man who's written 20 books? Well, I, I think in, in, I, 
I have uh, uh, six novels, and uh, apart from the children book and non-fiction books, I have six novels and one memoir uh, uh, book. Uh, three of the six novels are, are uh, take take place in the Valley of Jezreel, uh, in almost the same village in the Valley of Jezreel. And some people complain about it, as if saying that I, I keep telling the same the, the same story about the same people. And then I say, just a second. <coughs> I'm sorry, I have a, a sore throat. Uh, that it is my own habit when I start a new book, is that I allow myself uh, to leave this book after 30 or 40 pages. This is when I decide if I will finish the book or not. I think this is the privilege of every reader in the world, is to leave a book. It doesn't mean that the book is, is bad. It doesn't mean that the reader is bad. It means that this was a blind date that didn't work out. In <laughs> uh, the same way as you can rise up from your seat in the coffee place and tell the lady, or she can rise up from her seat and tell it was very nice, but we have to separate at this early stage of our relationships, we can say the same to a book. You don't have to throw it away. It happens too, but you don't have to do it. But you can just close it uh, politely. And if, some, if people think or feel that, uh, that a writer repeats himself and they don't like it, they think they, they can read another writer. I mean, there are so many writers in the world and, and uh, it's, 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 a, it's a free world, and the same way there is a freedom of expression, there is also the freedom of, con of consumption, uh, 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 the freedom of writing and the freedom of reading, you know? So I decided that I'm allowed to write about whatever I want to write about, and whatever makes me write, and whatever uh, uh, stimulates me and and tortures me and makes me uh, 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 makes me write this story and if there are people who do not like this story or think that I do something wrong they are always invite always uh, it's a possibility to read another book but I think the question also refers to the fact that we think we're writing different books but somehow what we do is um, incorporate themes that are occupying our minds again and mm -hmm. again, or characters who we've created or come across in our lives and they get regenerated in different ways. So it's not even, my question isn't even about whether you think that you, or, or you've been you know, offending readers by writing things, that, you know, three books that take place in the Jezreel Valley, but rather, do you think you as a writer return to certain character types or certain themes again and yes. again? I have, uh, in all my books, there is always a, a lady who is a cousin of a lady from the previous book. It's not the same, it's, it's not the same woman, but she is her cousin. They look a little bit alike, they behave a little bit alike. I have this collection of Atalanta-like nymphs from the um, Greek mythology. Uh, it's, it's a character I, I like very much. I, I'm sorry we don't have such a character in, in Jewish literature. Uh, and, and, and this is a girl that I keep finding in my books, in my dreams too, from time to time. Uh, and you know, it's my privilege to... Uh, I feel bored if she's not in the book I'm writing just now. <laughs> I want her next to me, and uh, so it's, it's, it's because I can, you know? So she's, she's, she's there. Um, and I think there will always be something uh, about the narrator, the first person who tells the story. He will always feel as if he stands a little bit on the side, uh, not in the center of the book he is telling. And this is something I do without a purpose. It just happens like this. So I guess this is my nature. As, you mean as your, a your first person characters always stand? A little bit on the, the side. side. They are not in the uh -huh. center of the They're book. The book the, yeah. And, and, um, and there is always, I, I keep repeating myself, writing in the first person. Mm. It's, uh, you once said uh, that <coughs> you, you do write in the first person and that you hope one day to be, uh, I don't remember how you put it. Uh, to be able. To be able to, to write, write in the, the third person, which is easier to write in the third person. 
because you don't have this filter of another storyteller between you and, and the reader. Uh, if, if you write in the first person, then you, you tell the story to your first person, and he tells the story, but then you have to, 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 to uh, consider his personality, his way of life, his way of, of looking at things. He's, he's a different person than you are. And you also have to decide how much information you will give him or will he know more than other people in the book or less than other people in the book? And what do you do about it's, scenes where he's not there? Yes, and, and, and when, you, when you write in the third person, then you know everything and, and all the rest know only as much as you, you let them know. So, so why not do that? It bores me. It, it, it's, uh, uh, when, when, I, when I write in the first person, immediately I'm... In, in, in a, in a mice, in a fiction, in, with, in something which is not true. Because the first person is never me. And, and when I use the word I for a different person, uh, then immediately I'm in, the, in a different world, in a different uh, reality. It's not myself. The first time I used I as me was in this memoir about mm -hmm. my grandmother. And, and it was a, a, some kind of a funny feeling. But, but what you said before about us uh, telling the same story, it's not only us, it's all writers are telling, story, repeating stories of other writers as well. You know, it's, uh, it's, I think it was as early as Henry Fielding in, in the story of Tom Jones, who already wrote, I think, uh, 200 years ago, wrote, we are all chefs of the same uh, 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 beef. We serve the same bull to the to the not in not in this re, not in this meaning. Yes and no. Uh, uh, the the same is he said the same the same ox to the to the diners. But we cook it in different ways. But the material, the story, there are about seven eight. Uh, stories, and we keep telling those seven, eight stories all the time. Yes, it will be do. the love story, the revenge story, the parent-children story, the, the married couple story. It's from biblical time. It's, it's the same themes. So why bother to keep writing? But, but I didn't why bother to keep writing if all the stories have been told? It, because you, you're telling them, you're telling them in a different way, in a different manner. We all deal with the human nature. And human stories. So, let's say that Homer already wrote about the man who comes back home. So, uh, I mean, we can keep telling this story again and again. And, and there are many versions of the man coming back home uh, uh, theme. And they are different from Homer. But Homer is always in the background, mm -hmm. uh, uh, listening, maybe smiling. But still, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's it, he already wrote about it before us. Well, you mentioned, um, you know, your first, your first person narrator, that you like that mm -hmm. form. Uh, by the way, I have two books that I will not re recommend to you. Mine, I only write in the third person. No, I like so to far. read third ah, you person, do? Okay. Not, but not... Then not I have two, two nice books not. to recommend to you. <laughs> um, but um, in, in terms of um, building the character, I mean, when you're writing in a first person voice, you have to develop the character that you are writing from. Mm -hmm. And you're also developing the characters around. And I remember once, um, I guess it was when we were working on Pigeon and a Boy, I confronted you on a character. Mm -hmm. I, um, there was something, uh, I don't even remember what it was, and I hope you don't either, um, but there was something that bothered me in, in uh, motivation of one of the characters, and I asked you about it. Uh, and you immediately pulled out a little notepad um, and you were flipping pages to show me something about how you'd built the character. Could you tell me? Yeah, could you I tell remember the... what it was about. I think it was about the scene when he kills, when Yair, the narrator of A Pigeon and the Boy, kills and slaughters a pigeon that came into his new house. And you said, it's a question that, which is repeated by American readers and not other readers mm. at all. Uh, why did he kill this pigeon and why did he eat this pigeon? It's, it's a cruel scene. And then I showed you that a few chapters before, it was already discussed the issue of what will happen if a, if a pigeon will infiltrate into this uh, new house that 
pigeons, pigeons should not be in the, in the new house because they represent his past and all his troubled life uh, 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 before. It is something I, I prepared in, in, in advance. And I think if you could share a little bit about how you prepare your characters, though. I remember you had these, these notepads and everything. Can you tell the audience? Well, I, I do a lot of research about first about the, the time and the place of, of my characters. Uh, um, and I also do uh, research about their, uh, their, 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 what they do. For example, I had to study uh, baking bread for uh, Esau. I had to study a lot of agriculture in the early 30s and 40s for uh, the Blue Mountain, a Russian novel in, in Hebrew. I had to study uh, a stone masonry, uh, stone cutting, for Bevei uh, Toba uh, Midbar, this was not published in, in English yet, uh, and I had to, to study pigeon handling for a pigeon and a boy. I go to people who, who I went to people who raised uh, raised pigeon. I read a lot of material about military uses of, of homing pigeons, but I never baked one loaf of bread. I never raised one uh, one pigeon. And I never uh, uh, chiseled the stone while writing the book. I was watching other people. I was asking a lot of questions. I studied their language. For example, I came here to Barilan uh, 20 years ago when I wrote uh, Isao, my second novel, which is my favorite, by the way, uh, because there was a psychologist here who, who researched the language of pain. You know that, that uh, people who describe their pain to a doctor uh, have to use metaphors. We don't have words for pain. You cannot say, my pain is red, my pain is 10 centimeters wide. We don't have units, we don't have words. All we use are metaphors. My pain is like a, a hot needle in my flesh, it's like a hammer in my head, it's like somebody said, like a smoke in my thigh, you know, this is poetry, but still he wants to, to, to the doctor to understand, and this psychologist and other psychologists in, uh, in Canada and, and in the United States researched this language, and I also went to a pain clinic in, in Hadassah, you want to hear a nice story about the pain clinic in Hadassah? I think we want to hear a nice okay. story about the pain clinic. <laughs> Because we are storytellers. So I went to the pain clinic in Odessa to study the, la the language of, of, of people who want to be, to be cured, to, who suffer from horrible pains. And there was this man who came, every, every patient who came in, the doctor said, please miss, meet Mr. Shalev. Uh, he will stay here only if you allow him to stay and listen to our conversation. And of course, they all agreed because people who have chronic pains usually uh, like people to listen to their descriptions. <laughs> and in the families, people are, cannot hear them anymore, you know. <laughs> so, and here is a man who voluntarily wants to listen to them. <laughs> and, and I was listening and I was asking questions and I was writing down their metaphors. I have hundreds of metaphors of sick people. And, and, uh, and then I, I came back home and I, I, I wrote down and, and then a month later the doctor called me. And he said, do you remember the, the, this guy with the terrible pain in his shoulder from Ashkelon uh, who came to me? And I said, yes. He said, well, he came yesterday for a, a checkup and he came into the clinic and he was, he was very angry and he was bitter and he was short-tempered and he said, where is Dr. Shalev, who was, who was here last month? He, he helped me much more than you do. You know. and, and this is because I was nice to him, and I was asking questions, and I had all the time in the world, and I didn't look into the computer all the time like this. And he, he was relieved, you know, this, it, it has this, uh, uh, an effect. Well, now I know who to turn to next time I have a pain. <laughs> anyway. 
Um, a question about the popularity of your work overseas. Um, Any time uh, around the time that I was translating Pigeon and a Boy, people would say, oh, how could you possibly translate that book? It's so Israeli. And we also had this issue in the new book that uh, isn't out yet, but I brought it to show people. If you know the Hebrew version, then you know that this is taken from the Hebrew version. This is what it's going to look like when it comes out in October. Um, uh, in Hebrew, it was called Hadaval Hayakaha, and in English, my Russian grandmother and her American vacuum cleaner, <laughs> which actually makes sense. This is the memoir, the, the true story. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, there again, some people in the know said, oh no, that book will never go. How, how can you take a book like that and, and bring it to another culture? Well, look, when I published uh, a Russian novel, uh, Blue Mountain, the people in the Valley of Jezreel said, how can people in Tel Aviv read this book? You know? <laughs> but we all read, we all read uh, books uh, uh, that were translated from other languages. And uh, if, if I could read as a young man um, Moby Dick, which was written about a trade I have no idea about, about a, a time which is 150 years ago, uh, about a land I never uh, visited when I read it. And still this book grasped me and touched me to the, to the point that the first journey I made to the United States uh, a few years later, when, when I was 25 years old, the first thing I did when I landed in, in, in America was to go to Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard and, and visit these places of, of, uh, of uh, Moby Dick. And we all know what we know about other cultures and other uh, countries, primarily from novels we read that were translated uh, 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 by, by gifted translators from other languages. You know, if uh, what do I have to do with with the? I know nothing about the reality of, of Huckleberry Finn, for example. The language is not mine. The, the, the Mississippi is not mine. Uh, the slavery is not mine. Uh, um, nothing is mine in this book, but still, it's one of, of the classical books that every kid read all around the world. I, I suppose it has a lot to do with um, some of the themes that come up. Like, for example, in, in both of the books that I worked on with you, um, the small-mindedness of people in a small place. And that's probably something that people can relate to pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, also, when you're out in the world and you're meeting audiences around the world who have read your book in different languages, um, I, I'm curious what happens to you. Are you asked to discuss, with a capital S, the situation in Israel? I mean, you mentioned that you're not, you don't write books to educate people, convince people of anything, you're writing stories. But does that come up when you're it, out there? It comes up a lot, mainly by journalists who interview, and mainly in Europe. In, in America, very few journalists ask me about the politics of, of the Middle East or in Israel. Also in Russia. In Russia, I was never asked about uh, politics, but, but being interviewed by a journalist in, in Russia is like defending your thesis. <laughs> it, is, it is very deep and very knowledgeable and not easy. Uh, they are very serious uh, literature uh, journalists in, in, in Moscow. Um, uh, uh, in Belgium, they asked me if my book about my grandmother and her vacuum cleaner, one journalist said, well, Mr. Shalev, your grandmother was a Zionist pioneer who was very happy to bring an, a, a vacuum cleaner to the Valley of Jezreel. Does this, in a way, symbolize the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestinians? <laughs> in the land of Israel. And after I recovered, I, I, I said, it's not only that, you forgot to mention, this is an American vacuum cleaner. <laughs> this is a worldwide imperialistic uh, 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 how do you say? Scheme. Uh, imperialistic scheme, you know, you were you were very little in this in this kind of. So in Italy, in the Netherlands, uh, less in Germany, uh, also in Holland, they, they they ask a lot of uh, political questions. Sometimes I I feel they never read the book, you know. <laughs> they 
and you know, and and I don't like it. The, there are Israeli writers who who like to promote their books abroad by talking politics. I I'm ready to talk to 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 express my political views. I do it every week in the paper here. But but when it is a novel, I want to discuss my novel. Not uh, it, it doesn't necessarily a political uh, 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 writing. Uh, I know that you're very very pressed for time, um, but I, I'm I'm there, there is a doctor for throat that will see me in half an hour <laughs> in uh, in Tel Aviv. So I will I, you can feel that I. I have a sore throat. I'm sorry about it. I'm just hoping that we can, if you have time for just a couple of quick questions, With it would pleasure. be nice if there are questions that people yeah. would like to ask. Professor Walters, yeah, please. I, I wonder if you could uh, describe any place in which Evans' work you felt improved some of your... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and whether or not you would change uh, a new edition of, of, of the book. I, I did not change the Hebrew after a translation that, that I read. Uh, only our mutual friend, my Dutch translator, uh, Ruben, whom you, 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 you know by, by mails, uh, he is also a very talented editor, and uh, he finds, I have a very e good edit editor here in Israel, but still my Dutch translators sometimes find uh, a little uh, uh, contradictions that I have to correct, with, and then I put them also in the Hebrew. But, but, uh, but uh, um, I remember that when I sent, uh, give Evan, uh, when I gave Evan back of, of his translation, there were a lot of uh, question marks and, and uh, little lines, that, uh, things that I wanted to clarify with him. But I wrote several times the word yafe, yafe on the side of, of a sentence, meaning this is beautiful, not only the translation, but, but also the way it, it looks sometimes even better than, than the Hebrew. I don't remember the exact places, but if Evan keeps these manuscripts, he can, he can just show the places where, where I write Yafé. I'm sure I've snipped those and stuck them on the wall somewhere. Yafé, Yafé is about the highest compliment from Meo Shalev, so that's I, something to hang on to. I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a compliment, Yafé. I took it that way. Yeah. Also, it's Hitpa'alut. Yep. Very nice. Uh, yes, back there, in the black shirt. Um, you mentioned repeating story by the writers and repeating us of your own work. And cliche is uh, the ultimate crime that no writer wants. I, I cannot hear you. I was, I was saying, how do you draw the line between repeating yourself and repeating writers you've read and cliche, which is how do you draw the line? Well, cl cliché is not necessarily something wrong, because if it was wrong, it was, would not have become a cliché, you know? Uh, if, it, if it was wrong, people would keep using it all the time and making it into a cliché. Today, when you say, love thy neighbor as yourself, this is already a cliché, you know? It was said so many times. Ve'avta le'reacha kamocha that it's sort of boring to keep repeating it, but still it's a wise, deep uh, 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 saying. So for me today, cliche is something more on the this, on this style of, of, of telling the story and not necessarily on the content of the story because it is cl cliche to say that if a man is coming back home and find some clues of his uh, wife's infidelity, it will make him a little bothered or even more than that. This is a cliche. You know, it is always true. Uh, but the question is, how do you describe this story? How are you going to tell it to, to the reader? This, is, this will be the distinction between a cliche and something uh, original. Yes. Could you brace us with two sentences opening of one of those two books in both languages, just so we can hear the cadence? I don't know if... Do I, I don't I'd have the copy in, in, in Hebrew, Hebrew, no. And uh, can you show me the... the, the, the no, it's a Davar Yakaha. Maybe yeah. I will remember... Well, that I remember the ah, first no, line. Show, show, me the, show me the pigeon and the boy. Maybe I will remember it. Okay. Uh, here, the, the first sentence here is... 
and suddenly said the elderly American man in the white shirt, suddenly a pigeon flew overhead above that hill. And it was, ufitom amara americani azaken bachulza levana, ufitom, I forgot. Maybe kulanu rainu yona? No, I forgot, I forgot the exact uh, 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 Hebrew. But, uh, Let's try another one. Okay. This is how it was. Hadavar Hadavar haya kacha. Kacha. Several years ago, on a hot summer day, I rose, I rose from a pleasant afternoon nap and made a cup of coffee for myself. And while I stood sipping from the mug, dot, 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 I noticed that everyone was looking strangely at me and holding back their laughter. And we have to end the paragraph. We have to do this. Yeah. When I bent down to put my sandals on, I discovered the reason. My toenails, all ten of them, had been painted with shiny red nail polish. <laughs> Thank you to Mayor Shalev. Thank you very much.